Hi, welcome to our LinkedIn Live on Human Focus Leaders. So I'm Sarah and I will be dealing with any questions that come up today as we go through the session. So as always, if you could let us know in the comments on LinkedIn where you're joining us from and ask any questions as we go through just to make it as interactive as possible. I'm going to hand over now to Joan who will introduce the session and our guests. So hi, Joan. Hi, Sarah. Thanks very much. And good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the session. Thank you for coming along. Today, we're going to be focusing on the and beyond leader and and beyond leadership. And I'm delighted to be joined by Ian O'Doherty, who is the CEO of the Appreciate Group, and Ellie Armour, as you can see on the screen, who is the HR Director of Speedy Services. And they will be sharing their views, their experiences on what they believe are and beyond leaders and what it takes to be able to be one. Before we get into the discussion, I'm going to ask each of them to briefly introduce themselves. So Ellie, if I can ask you first. Yeah, of course, Joan. And obviously I was already and beyond leadership trying to actually expand beyond my name into the job that I have too. So I'm the HR Director uh, from Speedy Services. I'm delighted to join you guys today. Um, I've only been with the business for 10 months. Um, prior to that, I have previous HR director roles in engineering, retail and distribution. And I'm looking forward to having some great debate with Ian over leadership. Thanks, Ellie. Ian, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, John, thank you. Yeah, my name's Ian O'Darty. I'm the CEO of Appreciate Group. My background is in financial services. I spent over 25 years with MBNA, which at different times was part of Bank of America and Lloyds Banking Group. But, but now, as I said, with Appreciate Group, we're a provider of prepaid gift cards and vouchers to the uh, corporate and consumer markets. Great. Thank you. And as I say, welcome to our session. So in a moment, we'll get started on the questions. But to help set us up and for everybody's benefit who's joining us today, let me set the scene by giving a definition of what we're meaning by and beyond leadership. And it comes from the research we did last year and from the paper we published that we've mentioned before. And there were five things that came out of our research that define the and beyond leadership. And they are looking beyond the norm. So that's looking about looking more broadly, looking wider, not just going with the immediate or usual sources for ideas and solutions. It's also about thinking differently. So looking past the current trends, looking far enough out, looking for the emerging trends that are coming up and the future trends and engaging with them. It's also about thinking the unthinkable and engaging with that and thinking about what are we going to do about it. And you know, if the last year and a bit has taught us anything, uh, we obviously need to be thinking about the unthinkable, probably on a much more regular basis than we did in the past. Our fourth point is around collaborating outside of the obvious. And again, that's about not going to the usual sources. Examples of that are about wider employee groups being involved in conversations and being able to get, suggest ideas. It's about engaging with your clients, your suppliers and your competitors to help come up with the best solutions for the industry and yourselves. And the final one is about positively contributing to society. So being aware of the impact you and your organisation are having on society and the planet. So there are five themes that sit under our and beyond leadership. So if I can now come to both of you with our first question, and Ellie, I'll ask you first, and then Ian, if you want to, to come in after that. Can you give us some examples? Because I think this is what people are always interested in, is examples of where you have seen and beyond leadership happening in your own organisations. Ellie, over to you. Thanks, Joan. Um, I mean, I don't wish to point out the obvious, but the pandemic has probably seen us all have to go to a completely different place and as leaders have challenged us in a, a very, very different way. Um, at Speedy, we really have had to go beyond leadership um, and we've really had to challenge our, ourselves significantly. Um, we've had to reinvent you know, some of the services, the processes, um, the way in which we support our staff you know, completely from where we were before. Um, and during that process of you know, coming together as a group, remotely via teams a complete you know digital platform that where none of us were familiar with um we realized very quickly that you know whilst everyone was looking at us as the leadership team we didn't have all of the answers we really didn't um and actually what we had to do and i guess in terms of that you know and beyond leadership skill set 
um, we really had to collaborate outside of the norm. You know, we really had to trust that we couldn't ourselves have all of the answers and, and actually step outside of not only the executive board and invite our senior leadership teams, our management teams to support us in some of the decision making that we needed to do. But we also went outside of Speedy. So the particular example that, that I lean upon is that we, we joined the, um, the Supply Chain Sustainability School. So that was actually lots of industries that come together um, and we talk about the key issues out in business. Um, and actually those working groups and those conversations that um, our COO and Dan Evans has, has actually been part of has really helped us you know, come back as a group and understand that we're all facing into the same challenges and have got all sorts of ideas that we should use together. So rather than working against our competitors, and so many of them sit around the Supply Chain Sustainability School and our suppliers, we're working together in working groups um, to try and modify what we do into the future. So I think that's something that has been quite different from Speedy. Um, it's been a bit uncomfortable at times because you don't always want to share your treasures, you know, but ultimately um, there's lots more treasures out there. Um, so it's not just about the, 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 the supply chain school, but it's also then about our leaders and actually empowering them to be part of that school, giving them access to all of that material and, and trusting that they're making the right decisions for their people because we're not all around all of the time like we used to. So, so we are having to make on the spot decisions. So, so for us, that's what Ambion leadership has looked like. It's really been that collaborating outside of the norm. And you said it hasn't always been easy or something along those lines, Ellie. So what, what helped make it happen, if you like? How did people overcome the difficulty of it? Well, I think the thing that, that, that's helped most is that as, as a team, we've made some sort of significant changes. We've, we've brought in different experts. We've acknowledged that we haven't got all of the answers. So if I take um, retail, which is a, a, a piece of business that we're diversifying into, so we're taking higher into retail, which is you know completely different for Speedy. Um, we've taken the pandemic and said, well, this can accelerate that. Um, but we aren't experts in retail. Um, so let's bring in an expert from retail to really help our thinking. Let's trust that, you know, other people are going to be able to support us and guide us. And that whilst we are the executive board, you know, I, I'm not the fountain of, of all knowledge. And, and it took people a while to get there um, and, and to relinquish that kind of um, uh, yeah, their own innermost thoughts around how they thought it might be, you know, and the direction of travel they thought they were going and to actually empower somebody else to, to, to actually steer the ship slightly differently than what we probably thought we were going to do before the pandemic hit us. A lot of adjusting and adapting I'm hearing, Ellie, in terms of what people were doing. Ian, let's come to you then and think about it from your perspective. What have you experienced? Well, John, maybe no surprise that, like Ellie, the uh, experience of the last year or so gives you <clears throat> gives you a good illustration of it. I suppose I would start with um, when when lockdown um, came the reality. Obviously, first priority for us was making sure we looked after the well being of our colleagues and um, of our communities. And I, I put that in the bracket of your positive contribution thinking. You know, um, we wanted to make sure that we took all the correct precautions that we followed the government guidelines. And we set that out very clearly at the start and said it to all our colleagues that this is the starting point. This is how we're going to do things. And, and everything then flowed from that. Just like Ellie said, you know, none of us had the, the ultimate answer. No one person had the answer. And we all had to think differently. It was very much new and there was no playbook that came with it. You know, and just because you had a fancy title didn't mean you knew all the answers. So you really did have to think differently. Um, we collaborated with organizations and in ways that were different from what we'd be used to. We were suddenly talking to your different forums that might have people that were in businesses and, and markets that had nothing to do with us, but they were sharing that same need for how do we deal with this pandemic situation? So we, we definitely were collaborating beyond what would be our norm, um, sharing ideas, getting ideas and not being precious about where they came from, just listening and understanding and then trying to apply to our, our own situation. You know, just like 
Ali said about not being the font of all knowledge. You know, as CEO, you don't have all the answers um, and no one role has all the answers. So we, we went looking for inputs from all over the place, especially internally. You know, we talked to our employee forum, focus groups, just generally communicated constantly, but asked for inputs and questions and comments. And, and just wanted engagement because there are ideas out there that, that help you and, and they'll spur another idea and get you a better idea and all the rest of it. So that's the beyond the norm, I suppose, in your language. And um, and then also we, we absolutely have to think the unthinkable because our business, there's a big element of physical distribution of product. And back around May, June of last year, we were very unclear as to how we were going to get physical product out to our customers. And especially in the run up to Christmas, which is a big time for us, but the time to plan for it is May, June time. So we were definitely in a think the unthinkable. What if we can't get physical product out to people? And we have to recast our, our plans and think that through. Thankfully, we were able to. But a lot of the thinking that we put into, well, what will we do to cope with the unthinkable? A lot of that thinking still benefited us, even though the unthinkable didn't happen, if that makes sense. Yeah. So when, when you sort of pull it all together, we didn't set out with a label of let's think as and beyond leaders. We just... It, it came about that way, but but all the elements that you described definitely sort of were, were demonstrated in the way we had to react to the COVID situation. Great. Thank you, Ian. Sorry, yeah, go on, Ellie. I'd just like to add to that a little bit. Um, that almost the, the pandemic and any disruptor, realistically, I mean, obviously the, this one is common to everybody that will be watching today, but um, it kind of shines a light over all of your leaders and it's almost been like a an assessment tool hasn't it of of actually how people have performed adjusted adapted coped um because everybody's you know gone about it in a different way and and there's been some very unnatural ways of having to communicate work with people and um, you know our sales team has have really suffered massively from a a mental health point of view because they are used to being out in front of their customers talking to people every day our regional directors are used to being with their people um and it's been it's been really really tricky and it's been an extension upon extension upon extension so i, I use it as a, as almost like a mini assessment tool that now says look our leaders can talk to us about where they struggled and actually start to develop a program um, that is that, that and beyond leadership program going forward. Whereas before it we all sort of about the core skills of leadership, you know, do, can I influence? Do I manage time properly? Am I planned? Am I organized? Can I, you know, write business cases? You know, can, can I inspire people, motivate? But it's almost like the language is quite good because it goes and beyond. So what are the extended skills that we need as a leader, um, particularly in the face of, of disruption? Um, but actually beyond that, it's almost like, you know, if you take this, is this, this is the foundation of leadership, then there's like, you know, this is your, your, this is your advance. And now we're going beyond advanced yes. leadership yeah. because, you know, this thinking the unthinkable, um, you know, working outside of the comfort zone of the norm of like inside of your business, you know, up against your competitors, et cetera, et cetera. But in order to, to really attract the best talent and, 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 and lead in a way that really inspires and creates vision and, and it's really attractive to our people, it's got to be about and beyond leadership. It's not the core skills anymore. Absolutely. I'm so glad you said that, um, which leads us to our next point, really. And, you know, both of you have talked about the pandemic and how the disruption of that has really forced most organisations to do things differently. For me, conversations I've had with people, there's some of the characteristics I think leaders need to have around courage and determination. And I suppose I'm, I'm wondering about, as we hopefully are coming out of the pandemic and we move into a different phase, um, how are you going to keep creating that environment for your leaders to stay in this mode, to continue to be in beyond mode, if you like? Ian, any thoughts that you want to share with us about that? Yeah, so... <laughs> Well, first of all, I, I hope we won't stay quite in the same moment forever because uh, we'd all like to move on. But um, and certainly the first few months, it was quite tense in terms of trying to figure it out and, and what can we do to, to cope with it. Playing on, on what Ellie said a moment ago, I mean, what the, the fact that we proved to ourselves that we can cope with the situation, the totally unexpected, um, and it, like most people 
having a, a suddenly everybody distributed out to working from home for the most part and dealing with all that. And we prove to ourselves that we can do it. The question then is what else can we you know, prove that we can do, right? That we didn't previously think we could do. But to your question about how do you create the environment, in my view, you know, key elements are, well, first of all, encouraging people to think the way we're talking about. It's not, it's not having a, a set list of, you know, A, B, C. It's just allowing them to think differently and be different and encourage that, respecting the differences of thinking. Because if, if I certainly wouldn't want to say to people, now go think the way I think. It's actually go think the way you think and just make sure you contribute that to the debate. And then be tolerant if occasionally we get it wrong. You know, I'd, I'd rather have, you know, um, be praising people for trying thinking differently than pillaring them for coming up with a crazy idea. We all have crazy ideas occasionally, but somewhere in there, there's a nugget. Obviously, there's a balance, but, but we do, I think it's encouraging, respecting, and then uh, tolerating when sometimes it doesn't go quite right, because that's that'll feed into you'll actually get some nuggets in there. Absolutely. And again, people I've talked to, clients I've talked to, is when, when they allow that to happen, the creativity, the ideas that come forward are pretty excellent. And actually, they get some really great, rich things that they can then work with. And it is that thing about tolerating mistakes. You know, many different management theories talk about that, you know, allow for mistakes, etc. Um, we find, though, sometimes leaders forget about that to allow for that piece, Ian. So again, what else do you do to help make sure that people around you, your leaders, the people below you and below them, do keep that happening? What are the messages you give? Well, I suppose, I mean, I'd like to think I give the message that, that it's okay to, to speak up and have ideas. I want people to be themselves and, and think differently. I, I want to have people around the table that do think differently and that, that you know, I would hope I exhibit the trust in others to think differently and then they'll trust me to think they have to need to follow me. And you, you don't want people who are looking to you as the, the leader as have, supposedly having all the answers, because that's, as we've said already, that's not the, not the case. You want people around you who have good ideas and, and who trust you to have ideas occasionally, but also trust you to listen to them and take it on board. So I suppose I try to demonstrate what I'm talking about, the encouragement, respect, and tolerance, and then get that back and then ask them, you know, to, to in demonstrate that within the organization. We talk a lot about the behaviors we want within an organization. We talk about, you know, how we want to demonstrate those behaviors and hopefully that sparks this kind of, you know, willingness to speak up, willingness to be themselves and have their own ideas, but also be accepting of occasionally not every idea gets implemented, but that doesn't mean it was a bad idea. So just, just that sense of tolerance and respect within the organization by demonstrating it, hopefully getting it back as well. Yeah. Uh, I, I fully agree with, with with Ian there. It's uh, it's you know quite similar that that comes from from my CEO. Um, he's you know he's, he's really open to you know the challenge and wanting to listen to people's views. And uh, similar to Ian, we you know we have the staff forum process etc. Um, but again, we want to kind of push the boundaries of that. And we've only recently put it together, but we have uh, an EDI working group. And actually, they've had some fantastic ideas, you know, people from different backgrounds about how we tackle well-being as an example, you know, during the, the pandemic, you know, how we communicate more about diversity and how we want to be a more, more diverse um, organisation. But that's coming from them as opposed to us thinking about how do we, you know, create a more diverse um, organisation, you know, and they've influenced, you know, the, the business, you know, in supporting pride and really getting behind some massive activities this week. So this is all about empowering the people, giving them a voice, but not only, you know, listening, um, but actually then acting upon what they're saying and allowing them to lead the way as opposed to then taking over their idea and implementing it ourselves. So that's certainly, it's very early days, but um, so, something that I feel will gain momentum, having more working groups um, that are going to, you know, help us with all of the challenges that, that lay ahead. Great. And thank you, Catherine, for the comment that you've just been putting up. And I can you've you've talked about the safe space in your comment, Catherine. So if I can come back to both of you just to think about, you know, one of the things that I'm always struck by is that 
you know, with the best will in the world, these things don't always happen. You know, things, people stop doing it some of the time, if you like. So again, thinking about what you both do to encourage the leaders within your organisations to create that safe space that Catherine's talking about, because that is so, so important to getting people to be willing to try to do things differently, to be inclusive. So anything you can share with us around that that you've done? So I think in terms of, you know, creating that safe space, um, you know, personally for me, it's, you know, it's it's about, you know, the sorts of meetings that you have, the working groups that you have in place, um, the people that are in attendance to those working groups, um, being able to be really open and transparent all the time with, you know, what the challenges are and, and sharing um, ensuring that you know where there are things that need to be you know anonymous gathering of data or people would like to make remarks without having their name attached to stuff um, having digital media where people can have conversations online and comment on things that have been published that we've done um, so I think there's lots of different channels that, that we use and that we promote inside of CD. Um, and, that's, and, and, and I would hope that everybody feels that they do have the opportunity and the media in which that they can communicate with us in, in a place where nobody's going to then there be any retribution or, you know, well, why do you feel that way? You know, we've recently just done our People Matters survey. That's something that off the back of that, you know, is, is a real strong message. So whether you've got 50% engagement or 90% engagement, you know, we're not there with a whip saying, well, you know, what on earth are you doing? You know, this is about, okay, well, that is the perception. We have to accept that that's our people's perception, you know, in that particular division, in that particular depot, whatever it might be. So now let's work together with those people and let's listen to the changes that, that they would they would like to make. Now, at the moment, they've made it anonymously, but as a collective, they will be able to work together to put those action plans in place. So those sorts of channels are, are what we use at Speedy. But I think it will be better for me personally when I could be out and about. So yesterday I was in our Leicester depot and, you know, it was fantastic talking to all of the drivers, you know, the lifting engineers, the warehouse operatives, the management team and all of them, you know, talking to us, you know, about, you know, what a challenge it has been over the last last 18 months and what, they we could do be, be doing better you know and let let you know we're never going to have it it's never going to be perfect and even if i ticked all of the boxes then they'd think of something else that we could be doing so you know we'll never be perfect leaders and i think that's another thing to accept you know we shouldn't beat ourselves up we should learn from from the lessons and and from what we you know listen to from our people Thanks, Ellie. And you used the word collective, and I got very excited when you used that, because for me, that's going into that whole thing about collective responsibility, collective leadership. And as we know, you know, any movement of change, of positive change, comes from people coming together and having the will, the desire and the skill um, and the environment to make it happen. So delighted to hear what you're saying. You know, keep that, keep that going, please. Ian, coming to you, and I'm, I'm aware that time is flying past, so we'll, uh, I'd like to hear your views on this, and then I'm going to come to our question about what do you think is out there so just to get you ready for that one um, but again the safe space idea what else do you either do you do or do you see your leaders doing to create that space a bit like Ellie on the, one of the points of where we do engagement surveys we make a point of highlighting the less than positive output if you like the less than positive comments as much as the, the positive comments because I think that's really important that people see that we're open to that, open to hearing about whatever is the challenge, if you like, <clears throat> and willing to to have it voiced and aired. I've seen organizations where that's not the case and it isn't well received. And then, like Ellie was saying, in our case, that's also anonymous. So you wouldn't know who said what, but you, you at least air it out. But then uh, it's a technique that I would use occasionally is when I do know that somebody has made a comment or asked a question at a, at a, a town hall gathering or or whatever, um, you know, to, to acknowledge it and recognize and say thank you for you know for asking the question that everyone else wanted to ask but nobody was brave enough to ask, or if somebody has an idea that you know, means that I change something or whatever, acknowledging that that was the case if if it's possible to do it. So so to see that that you're if you like given license to those ideas that might be challenging and 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 cause new ideas or point out of a failing or a flaw of some kind. That's fine. We all get things wrong. Why, why not admit it and then acknowledge it? So 
I think s small things like that can make a difference that people will feel confident enough that their head's not going to be bitten off for speaking up. You know? Great. And we can see that Jill's just popped a question up about how can we make sure we carry this on? Any other thoughts on this that you can share at the moment around what you can be doing, what we all need to be doing as we move into this new way of working, whatever it looks like? Well, I mean, one of the things that, you know, um, my team are working on is um, a complete review, really, of what are our values and our leadership skills, because, you know, what we put in place five years ago as Speedy probably has significantly changed. So rather than trying to hang on to, to what was put in place, let's actually have a review, have a refresh um, and reflect probably the new culture that needs to be put in place. And, and actually, you know, let's not, you know, sort of hide behind the elephant in the room. And let's say, look, you know, people want to know what is the future going to look like? What's going to be the expectation? You know, are we going back into the offices? Will we be there two days a week, three days a week? You know, how is my role going to differ? And you know, actually, if I am somebody who's an engineer that has been going into site every day and I haven't, because actually for them, they haven't had that beauty of being able to work from home. You know, they've carried on on the front line. Um, albeit those of us that have had to work at home for now 18 months are probably like let me out and we're jealous of the engineers that are able to go into site um, is you know what's going to be different from that for them into the future as well because you know they they haven't seen their managers their sales teams their directors as often as they used to is that is that going to be the same going forward how will they get the key messages how will they get the spirit of the, the speedy organization how will they understand strategy um, how will they know what role they play in the organisation going forward and what they can do to you know, help us grow? So I think that there's there's a lot to be said for a complete overhaul of our, of our leadership principles at Speedy. And then it's about holding people accountable to it, isn't it, Ellie? And I'm going to move on to Ian, so I'm not expecting you to reply to this one, but there's that, you know, we can put all of these things into place. We have to then, as leaders, make sure people are behaving in that way and we hold them accountable and we address issues when we hear that they're not happening, which leads me nicely, certainly in my head, to the question that's popped up on the screen. And Ian, you talked before about focusing on the well-being of people. So is there anything you can share in the last couple of minutes here around, you know, what you've done within the organisation to bring Break down the stigma of mental illness and the behaviours you've encouraged your leaders to demonstrate. Yeah. Well, I, I can really not, not claim the credit for it because my HR director and her team have done a fabulous job on this one. But and, but also across the organisation, there was a very open reaction to the need for for addressing it. You know, in the sense of let's make sure we stay in touch with people. Let's make sure we call people. When, when it was full, fully remote and no, no clear prospect of being back in the office anytime soon. I mean, people diligently, conscientiously thinking about, I need to talk to folks, I need to call them and just make sure they're okay, not wait till I have to do it, but actually phone them and try and engage with them. And then also just encouraging, um, encouraging individuals to speak up if they felt there was something, uh, help that might be useful that let us know, but also encouraging managers to, to be thinking about that and asking the question and trying to spot signs so that they could help flag somebody who, who might need a bit of help, might need some resource and maybe was too shy or unaware or whatever to ask for it. So there's a combination of things, but it, most of all, it's about an awareness and an openness and be, being able to say, this this does matter. It's it's not a problem to speak up. Let's speak. We want to help, but we don't always know that we need to help. So, so it's a two-way street, so to speak. And and speak up and then try and if you're a manager try and encourage your team to speak up be aware speak to hr about how do you get resources to help so there's there's a number of different elements i don't think they're really rocket science most of mm. it is about awareness and willingness and the enthusiasm and, and desire to to do it right if you follow me yeah, absolutely. And I think that willingness to share a bit of vulnerability again for leaders. I've heard so many stories of where leaders have shared how they are, how they're feeling about it. And again, that helps encourage others to be, to know it's OK to talk about it and to seek whatever help they might need. Thank you for that. Um, we are coming into the final seconds minute of our time together, but I, I'd be keen if there was one thing around, you know, looking to the future. What's already out there that leaders need to pay attention to now? Is there one thing you would say that we all need to pay attention to? Let me start with you, Ian, if I can, and then Ellie, if I can, and obviously if we can keep it brief because of our time. Um, 
if I'm following your question, I mean, I think what, what I would say is that there's a lot of people who've just been through a lot and learned a lot. I mean, just listening to Ellie, I learned from her experience in this short period of time. And, and anybody you speak to who's been through, because the different business, different circumstances, you learn little bits. So I think there's lots of experience out there. Don't don't think that just because we're hopefully soon going to be back to to not not uh, restricted in some way that we should stop learning. The learning should continue. The sharing and the you know we should keep it going in some fashion, not in an identical fashion, but in some fashion. Thank you, Ian. Ellie, final words from you. I just think from a, a global perspective, I think the whole kind of ESG agenda, and obviously for me, my heart lies in that social piece that. You know, it, it's coming and it's coming big style. And, and, and actually, from a, a mental health and well-being point of view, I think we've got to do far more to help our people as they return to whatever the new norm might be. Um, and just a golden nugget, we do a Times Talk Day every month. You know, so it wasn't a na- na- not just the national day. We do it every month and we down tools and we ring people and we engage in whatever the monthly Times Talk conversation is, all gauged around mental health awareness. Great, thank you. Thank you both, because not only have you been talking about the and beyond leaders and, and what that means and how you've seen that operate, but it's very much also a lot about being a human focused leader and putting the attention on the humans. So I've got hope hearing the two of you that in terms of the people and the planet and the social conscious, certainly you two are doing your bit and helping your leaders do it. So a big thank you from me for your participation today. I hope if you've been listening that you have enjoyed it and heard some interesting reflections and insights from Ellie and Ian. And thank you, Sarah, for managing us so well. I'm gonna hand back to you now to do whatever you do to close us off. Okay, I'm just going to put this final comment that's just appeared. Now, there's a few comments coming through now. So we will be back um, in a few weeks, I believe, with another um, session, Joan. So if you would like to follow our page, 1080 page on LinkedIn, then we'll be publishing details on there. Um, As always, what we will do after this session is just go through and answer the questions that have been raised again in kind of text format so that people can um, see those afterwards. Um, And yes, so we'll be back in a few weeks. So thanks, everyone everyone for joining um, and look forward to next time. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye.